Welcome back, everyone, and welcome to our new listeners to the Becoming Immune Confident podcast. My name is Dr. Kara Wada. I'm a board-certified pediatric and adult allergy, immunology, and lifestyle medicine physician, certified life coach, and systemic Sjogren's patient. Today, I am so excited to welcome one of my esteemed colleagues, Dr. Akil Pawansami. He is a Harvard-trained physician author and holistic medicine expert in the integrative and functional medicine spaces. He has a new book that's coming out May 9th called The Tiger Protocol, which I've been able to be reading in the background, which integrates the best of conventional and holistic medicine. Dr. Akil presents a comprehensive protocol to help you treat and heal your autoimmune conditions, including rheumatoid arthritis, Hashimoto's, MS, lupus, Sjogren's, and more. Groundbreaking and timely, the Tiger Protocol teaches you how to eat right, detoxify, resolve infections, optimize your microbiome, and relieve stress to feel better than you've ever felt before. Based on his own experiences helping thousands of patients, Dr. Akil provides definitive practical guidance on diet, lifestyle, and supplements that can heal autoimmunity. He presents a revolutionary plan that utilizes nourishing foods, powerful healing spices, and targeted supplements to help you reduce inflammation, improve energy, and transform your health. Welcome, Dr. Akil, and thank you so much for joining us this week. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Kara, for having me on the podcast. Yeah. If you wouldn't mind, you know, we learned a little bit in your bio about the Mm -hmm. protocol, but how did you end up here? How did you end up writing the book? I first got into integrative medicine through my own illness journey, like many of us. And that started about 20 years ago during my medical school, where I developed this mysterious illness that no one could diagnose and developed severe fatigue, chronic pain, and weight loss. I couldn't sit up. I couldn't use a computer. I had to stop my training because all the conventional treatments were not working. I was doing physical therapy, prescription drugs, but I took that a year off and I then I just had to seek out other options and it was actually integrative medicine that really turned my health around and helped me to feel better than ever before and I knew that I wanted to train in that so after residency I did a fellowship in integrative medicine with Andrew Weil and then in the topic of autoimmune diseases it just grew organically in my practice I started seeing more and more patients with this issue it's very rapidly growing And then they would get some good results and they would share with their friends. So my practice grew more and more as I saw how integrative medicine can help with the immune system. I know we've talked on the podcast with a few other guests about integrative medicine, but maybe for those who haven't listened to those episodes yet, Mm -hmm. explain what that means. Yeah, great question. Integrative medicine basically refers to integrating conventional and alternative therapies. So things like diet, lifestyle, herbal therapies, other systems like traditional Chinese medicine or Ayurveda. It is still evidence-based. So we try to find what is the research-supported things we can draw from other therapies, alternative systems, and then integrate that together with Western medicine so we can have the most number of tools to help our patients. That's what I very much appreciate, the both and approach rather than either or. Right. Maybe we can jump in. Can you tell us what TIGER stands for? I love a good acronym. Absolutely. Yes. The five root causes of immune dysfunction and inflammation, which affects not just autoimmune disease, but I believe all chronic diseases. And those are toxins, I for infections, G for gut health, E for eating right, and R is for rest. The R covers stress and the mind-body connection. There is no kind of silver bullet for autoimmune disease. It really does take a multi-pronged approach, and that's why I chose these five elements to put in the protocol. Makes for a very compelling title and it all works together. So maybe we can jump in a little bit. We have had a series that we haven't had an episode labeled as such for a while, but this idea of going non-tox without the nonsense, what are some of those things that we may be encountering in our day-to-day existence that we may not realize could be problematic? 
Yeah, absolutely. When I did the research for this book, I was very surprised to find so many toxins linked to autoimmunity and inflammation. So in the book, I actually review 20 different toxins that have each been individually linked to autoimmunity. And the problem is when you start combining them, like in all of us, we have chronic low-level exposure to multiple toxins. This could be from the air, the drinking water, the food, the environment. So the, the goal with the TIGER protocol is not to make people afraid or overwhelmed, but to share this information to empower them, to just remind them that they do have their own detox capacity, their body has a system for that. So just trying to upregulate and boost that a little bit and then reduce toxin exposure. That's like the two-pronged approach I like. Yeah. And some of those toxins would include things from like plastics, personal care products, heavy metals, sorts of things. Exactly. Yeah. And then one thing which is not as well appreciated is waterborne toxins. Studies mm -hmm. have shown that there's many people like in the U.S. are exposed to low levels of certain chemicals, for example, PCBs, um, yes, and, that's yes. some, and then there's PFAs, which is a different kind of chemical. And then there's CE and then there's perchlorate. So a lot of these have been environmental used and they don't break down. That's the problem. They stay there for hundreds of years and then they make it into the water supply. So that's why getting a good water filter is, I believe, very important. Yeah, it's really good timing. So it's interesting. We have a, a community that I help lead with a dietitian friend of mine called Belong. And the theme for this week's private podcast in the group was we're doing a hydration challenge, but part of it was going through how to filter your water the ins and outs. And a lot of that comes from my dad's, he's retired now, but was in public health. Groundwater was like, his thing. So oh, I remember okay. from a really early age, he would have this model he would bring to the county fairs and oh. it would show what would happen when someone would inappropriately dump gasoline or oil down the drain or in the backyard mm -hmm. and how that then could end up in our water supply. Even as a little grade school kiddo, I, mm -hmm. I found that so First of all, the model, any type of diorama is really cool, especially in a pre-tablet. <laughs> I just think it's really neat how things come full circle. And here I am 30 plus years later, we're still yes. talking about the same things because they're still really important. Yes, I couldn't yeah. agree with you more. Yeah. Yeah. One of the tips he's given, I live in an area where we have a municipal water supply, so you can look up your data. And I know you provide some resources for that through EWG and link to that in the book. But growing up, we had well water. So it's one of those things you may not know. You are then the one responsible for typically obtaining that testing and making sure everything is, is safe. Exactly. And I'll just add one other tip, which is that they've studied the bottoms of shoes tend to carry things like pesticides, heavy metals, potentially toxic bacteria. So leaving your shoes near the front door so you don't track all those things into the house, that's something in Asian cultures, but that's something very beneficial as well and very, no cost to do that. Absolutely. Every time we have someone come over, my husband's like, yep, sorry, Asian household. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, we do the same thing. Yeah. I don't know that I've ever shared with him that was the rule in our house growing up too, but I'm totally on board. However, we spin it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. It's smart. And sometimes those common sense things really do, do have the research to support them as well. One of the other things I really appreciated and in, in reading, I will admit I have not gone all the way through. I've gotten about 80% through. Okay. I, I binged, was binge reading last weekend was I've been able to recommit to making some changes that I've done before, but to improve gut health. So one of the things you talk about a lot are these probiotic rich foods. So the difference between prebiotics, probiotics, postbiotics, let's jump in. Yes. So yeah, to start with defining those terms, prebiotic is something that feeds your good bacteria, and that could be foods or supplements. And I really emphasize prebiotic foods. Um, and then there are probiotics, which are good bacteria. Scented foods have probiotics, those beneficial bacteria. 
And then the postbiotics are actually metabolites that your good bacteria are supposed to produce, and they have a big effect on the microbiome. I think fermented foods are very beneficial, and I do emphasize them, but what I really believe prebiotic foods are less well-known. And so what I've tried to do in the book is go through all the main categories of prebiotic foods, like polyphenols, arabinoxalans, resistant starch, inulin, and then list the top 20, 30 foods for each of those so that people can choose. You don't have to eat everything, but select what you like and then have more options because the more different types of foods you can eat, especially plant foods, the more diversity you'll have in your gut microbiome. And we know that's the key metric for health and resilience and also longevity and reduced risk of all diseases. Yeah. And then we get to just eat so many other like delicious things too. Yes, exactly. And one of the other emphasis that you talk about, in addition to this plays into the diversity in yeah. plants that includes spices and herbs too. Yes. So I'm very influenced by Ayurveda, which is one of the systems I've trained in. And in that they believe spices are medicine. They're really considered their own category of therapeutics. Now modern research is confirming that because spices actually have prebiotic effects. They feed your good bacteria. They have very powerful antioxidants to combat oxidative stress. They reduce inflammation, which is very well known now with turmeric and other things. And then finally, they are really good for your gut. In Ayurveda, what is called the Agni or the digestive fire, just keeping your gut functioning well. So uh, a big part of my protocol is teaching people how to use more spices because they can help not only with the gut healing, but also with eliminating infections. In Ayurveda, a lot of spices are used for their goals of antimicrobial, getting rid of viruses, fungi, parasites, and so forth. So I teach people how to use uh, common spices like turmeric, ginger, and garlic, but then also less well-known like black cumin is very powerful, antimicrobial. There's uh, ajwain, which is another spice that's great for the gut. So there's so many spices I think we can take advantage of, and it makes the food taste better. Absolutely. It makes me look back at my childhood though, and just laugh a little bit because right. to be quite honest, until the Food Network came about and we mm -hmm. got cable, which was well into maybe middle school, high school, mm -hmm. bless my mom's heart. She learned from her mom how to cook. Yeah. My grandma was a mom of six kids. She was just trying to survive that 1950s housewife kind of mom. So my mom didn't know how to use an herb or a spice until like these things changed. So my whole like teens and adulthood has been this evolution into like, oh my gosh, food with flavor. How amazing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I think it's just testament that some folks will say, oh, I don't like that. Or I don't know. Some encouragement from both of us to say, give it a try. You never know. What's the worst that could happen if you take a little taste and you don't like it, just try again exactly. in a little while. Yeah, exactly. What I like is that there are many options that are not just very spicy hot. Most people think sure. about like chilies or super hot spices. And that's true. They have some benefit, but many people can't tolerate that level of spice. It upsets their stomach. But all of these other spices that I've talked about are more mild. They're savory. Mm -hmm. Some of them are even sweet, like fennel and coriander. You can use herbs as well, like mint, parsley, and cilantro. So even if you don't tolerate like a hot, spicy food, you can still incorporate spices in this way. Yeah. And a little bit really does make a considerable yes. difference. The amounts yes. you had mentioned in many cases, half teaspoon. There was an interesting study which looked at clove powder and oh, its yes. effect. Yes. And that only showed like one eighth of a teaspoon. Yeah, a little sprinkle. Clove powder every day for seven days. And it reduced blood inflammation markers in seven days. So just one eighth and of a teaspoon. You think about pears so nicely in a lot of just thinking of homey, Midwestern, American-y type cinnamon, right. nutmeg type recipes to add a little extra clove in there. It folds mm -hmm. in so nicely. And then you're getting one more plant to get towards that 30 to 40 plants in a week. You're getting that extra anti-inflammatory punch and it tastes good too. Yes. Yeah. And I love about clove also the fact that it's the spice that's the richest in polyphenols, which are those prebiotics that feed your microbiome. The second is actually dried peppermint. That is quite good oh, as well. Nice. But 
these are very high, like two or three times what you might get from like cacao powder or other things. So clove powder. Yeah. I'm a big fan of that. We use a lot of it. And what I'm hearing is this idea of what can we add? Yes. Taking precedence over, I know you, you mentioned exploring some elimination mm -hmm. type yeah. protocols, but you really always are coming back to that. Okay. What can we add back in? Yeah. That's my whole approach because I think that there's a place for an elimination diet, taking out possible food sensitivities, but I always believe reintroduction must be a priority and you don't want to stay on too restrictive of a diet long-term because then you'll start to lose some of that diversity of the large intestine microbiome, which we know is really really key for longevity. So that's very important. One of the questions I'm asked all the time, social media, and especially in the office, because I have a predominance of patients who are dealing with allergies, asthma, that yeah. TH2 type inflammation, histamine rich inflammation. There are a fair number of folks who say, Hey, I can't tolerate fermented foods because yes. they are high in histamine. Any tricks mm -hmm. that you found yeah. that I can yeah. pass along? That is a really good point. Yeah, that is a challenge because many patients can't tolerate good foods with the histamine. What I find that with histamine is that you have to look at the, the breakdown of it that's to be done by our good bacteria. Mm -hmm. You have bacterial overgrowth or imbalances, then your ability to process and break down histamine is really down-regulated. So in some patients, I've seen that if we can correct their bacterial overgrowth, correct their mm -hmm. dysbiosis or mm -hmm. the balance of bacteria, Area, then they start tolerating some of those foods in small quantities because their bacteria are starting to process histamine I now, guess. but it doesn't work in everyone. And in those cases, I think finding the prebiotic foods is equally powerful in terms of supporting the microbiome. Awesome. Thank you. That's what we've been working on, but sometimes you just get between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> right. Yep. <laughs> yes. Let's talk a little bit about rest and where that comes into play and how some of the places where our stories come together and have overlap is seeing harm in our own health during our training and experiences and what that puts our bodies and our minds through. Yeah, no doubt. I think that this is a really critical piece, rest, because we know studies have shown that stress is one of the key factors in the development of autoimmune disease and also in observations or remissions where there's a flare up and worsening symptoms. Many times when I talk to my patients about stress, their eyes glaze over and they just zone out because <laughs> maybe I think people are, maybe have heard too much forced on them. So I tell people really find what works for them and to know that there's a lot of different ways to approach this. You don't have to meditate for an hour every day. There's good research on meditation, but there's equally good research that other tools for mind body relaxation are helpful. Other practices like psychotherapy, counseling, gratitude, forgiveness practices, prayer for some people, their spirituality and religion can play a key role. Also, play I encourage people to try to incorporate more play, incorporate more just passive downtime. So there's lots of different ways to tackle it and finding what works for you and then making sure you're consistent. Doing that like several times a week is important to clear stress out of your body before it builds up and starts to have negative effects. It's not necessarily a trip to the spa, although that is nice. Yes. <laughs> Maybe yes. these little things, some ways that we've tried to sprinkle it throughout our week is when mm -hmm. we sit down to dinner, everyone around the table shares what they're thankful for or in the mm -hmm. case of my four-year-old, what made her happy that day? Because yeah. you just know what right. grateful or thankful exactly means. Sure. Or having fun. I'll just try to get into reading the bedtime book. So there's a particular book my girls love to pick, the book with no pictures. I don't know if you're familiar with this one. Oh, yes, my daughter yeah. loved that book. Yes, yeah. yes. And so right. I lean into it. Why not have fun with it and allow those happy chemicals that... Yeah. The rest and digest, the oxytocin, all those sorts of things to get some of our benefits from that. Yes. I love the way you're approaching that. It's fun to have then building some of those connections. Like you said, you know, that book with your daughter or what have you as well. Let's see. We've talked about the toxins. We've talked a little bit about the infections in the gut and eating and rest. If you had kind of one take-home piece of advice for folks who are 
on this journey, what would you share with them? Oh, so I think mindset, the importance of having the right mindset, I think is not emphasized enough because I see many patients that don't believe they can get better. They're been told by their doctors that they have to be on this medication for their whole life and their disease is incurable and just the things that also lead them to conclude they can't feel better, which is not necessarily the case. So I think the very first step is believing that you can feel better. And often when I say that to patients, they say, I'm the first doctor who's told them that they could feel better. And I think having that right mindset is very important because if not, then it's, it's easy to get overwhelmed with all these negative factors like toxins and infections and to just give up and not even try. But having that right mindset, I find is important to set the stage to make further growth. That's so helpful. And I think if for any of our healthcare professionals that are listening, remembering that our words have power and yes. just as much as they can be healing when we have that trusting therapeutic relationship, it's also the nocebo effect. So we can do harm in how we're talking with our patients, our clients as well. For sure. So critical. So the last question I always like to ask folks as we're wrapping up our conversation is, we recently have named the podcast, the Becoming Immune Confident podcast. And I just always love to ask folks, what does that mean to you? And how does that kind of relate to the work that you're doing? Oh, I love that. Yeah. I think that's exactly aligned with what I'm trying to do, which is empower people and realize that you have tools that you can implement to help your immune system and also to build up resilience because mm -hmm. life happens. My goal is to help people achieve their own dreams and live their life and not to be like not challenging themselves or trying to close down their opportunities or anything, but I want people to be empowered empowered to know that all these tools will help their immune system so they can go out in the world and do the things they want to do and still achieve their dreams and have a healthy and happy life. Sounds good to me. <laughs> yes. Where can people find the Tiger Protocol? I know that they can order it ahead, correct? Right, exactly. Yeah, they can pre-order it on any bookseller's website like Amazon or Barnes & Noble. It's available and it's coming out on May 9th, but it's available for pre-order now. Awesome. So we'll make sure to link to that in the show notes. And then if someone wanted to come see you in practice, where do you see patients? Yeah. So I see patients in Sacramento, California, but I see through video visits, people from throughout California. I do a lot of group visits as well. So the best way to learn more about how to connect with me is through my website, which is drakhill.com. And that has all of those. Excellent. We'll make sure to have that link as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Akhil. I appreciate your time, your energy, all the work you put into your book and I can't wait to have the act mm -hmm. in hand. So much, Kara. Yeah, yeah, this was a really fun conversation. And thank you again for inviting yeah, me. Yeah, and we'll throw a quick little plug. We're both going to participate in an upcoming Lifestyle Medicine Virtual Summit being put on by Somi Docs or Social Media for Doctors. So once that is up and running, we'll add that to these show notes once we have that information. And mm -hmm. you'll be able to watch presentations from us and from many more of our colleagues that are similarly minded mm -hmm. thinking about how we can use our everyday lives to help improve our health and healing. So that'll be really fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's mid June, I believe. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That looks to be a great event. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Akil. I hope you have a fantastic rest of your week and we will definitely be talking again soon. Thank you. My pleasure. Hey everyone. I am going to ask you once again to go into Apple Podcasts and submit a review of the podcast for me. But first, I'm going to share a review from Dr. Lex Rx. Dr. Wada's unique perspective is amazing considering she's both an autoimmune patient and physician. Her experience, expertise, and insight make this podcast so valuable. Keep them coming. One other from Amanda Catherine. Wow, so informative. Thank you for bringing more attention to autoimmune diseases. Each podcast is so informative and well thought out. Very impressed with all that you do. Thank you so much, Dr. Lex Rx and Amanda Catherine. 
I really appreciate the feedback and the review. If you aren't subscribed yet, head over to drkarawada.com and in the upper right corner, you can hit the subscribe button. Thank you so much because Apple podcast reviews are one of the ways to increase how many people are able to access and see all of this education and information we're putting out into the world.